speaking in Indonesia, and I think that I uh, I thought that I had recorded a presentation of it, <coughs> but then uh, when I opened up my computer, I realised that I hadn't pressed the right button. <laughs> so very very nice to be here um, this afternoon. Could, could I ask? You know who I am, but I don't know who you are. Would you Would you mind just briefly uh, introducing yourselves? Nazarene, yeah? Okay. Okay, yeah. Good. Okay, yeah. Yeah, and? Uh, my name is uh, Ismael, and Like, 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 uh, Nazarene, I'm also uh, researcher, uh, research assistant, and my supervisor is Watanapini. Okay, <laughs> good. Good. Hi, I'm Rubato, with my support. Yeah. Uh, research officer here in Kitab. Good, good. And? Hi, my name is Elmi. I is who? Elmi. Elmi. I'm studying at Kitab. Good. I'm doing my research and focus about modernity and agriculture. Sure. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, well, nice to know who I'm talking to. Now, um, uh, could I ask, um, you'll tell me when I've got five minutes to go or something like that. I mean, uh, I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm afraid I, I, you'll need to remind me. So we started at 25 past. Do you want me to stick to half an hour or a half an hour presentation or... What should I aim I for? Think it should be half an hour. Okay, so I'll try and squeeze it into half an hour, and I would rather say less, and then <laughs> and stick to the main points, and then give you all the opportunity to uh, ask questions. Um, I I I can't read your mind. I haven't managed to hack into your head. And so it's going to be easier for you to just tell me what you're interested in. That will be much better than me uh, guessing what you're interested in, perhaps probably getting that wrong. Okay, so I've set the timer for uh, 30 minutes. Okay, so uh, nice to be here. Um, you may or may not know that um, I uh, studied at uh, UKM uh, graduated here in 2009, so about 10 years ago, 11 years ago, I started uh, my three my time through the three-year doctoral tunnel, and so and I um, I'm very I'm always very pleased when I meet others studying at University of Bangsa in Malaysia, and I actively am recruiting uh, students uh, to study here. Um, I firmly believe that one's success in life is determined by God's grace and mercy, but also on uh, how hard we work rather than where we have graduated from. And uh, uh, there are maybe other universities that are more prestigious, uh, but I am very proud to be a UKM graduate and I am uh, working steadily at increasing the number of expatriate anomalies such as myself who have been here in the region for many years, who have good language, good connections and commitment to making a uh, constructive contribution uh, to this part of the world where we have been guests. So, um, I just wanted to, uh, I just want to begin. And, um, my, you, you may be here for a number of reasons. You may be here because you were told you have to attend. Uh, you may, you may be here because you are interested in Thailand. You may be here because you're interested in Islamic diversity and, uh, the Sufi constituency that exists in Thailand as well as Malaysia. 
Well, but you may be just interested in this idea of field work, and you may be interested in the idea of serendipity that I included in my abstract. There are, there are a number of challenges that people setting out to do their masters or entertaining doing their masters or who have recently begun a PhD or who are about to begin a PhD. And usually, and there's an exception to every rule, usually the biggest problem that students have is trying to narrow down what they are interested in. And this, uh, this has a number of manifestations. It's a disease that almost everyone suffers from, but some people suffer from more acute symptoms. Um, and so my experience, my personal experience has been, and my, uh, the wisdom that I pass on to people who ask my question about uh, research topics, is that it's very, very important to, first of all, decide what you are really interested in and to choose a specific aspect of a wider story and to go for a narrow and deep study of this story. In the course of you doing something, something deep, something deep but specific, you will learn about lots of other things. But that's actually not your topic. Your topic is specific, it's deep, but it's a specific aspect of a wider issue. Um, without that clarity, you are going to be confused and you're going to be distracted and you're going to drive your supervisor completely and utterly mad. If he is a, a guy, he might begin to pull out his hair and he may end up, like me, uh, deciding to shave it off instead. Um, but there are a number of uh, there's, there's a number of um, interesting things that have been written about serendipity in the in the enterprise of ethnographic research. Now, uh, most of you, if you're in a Malaysian university, you're more familiar with the British tradition in anthropology, and there's a bit of we, but if you read American anthropology, European anthropology, and British anthropology, you may be a bit confused about this, the idea of doing ethnographic fieldwork or ethnography. Some people use ethnography as, a, as an output as a, to describe a specific style of anthropological writing. Others talk about it as a method, as a, and I would use it as a method. Um, serendipity. Sometimes we set out to do something and we end up by doing something a little different. Now, slightly tweaking your topic is very different from instead of uh, wanting to do a study of land rights for gay whales, uh, looking at um, um, uh, Malay rappers in Batalin Jaya. Um, changing your topic completely and slightly tweaking your topic is completely different. Uh, this guy here is uh, Malinowski. Now you guys hopefully know who he is. He was, uh, he was Polish and he was a young scholar at the beginning of the 20th century and he set out from Cambridge at a time when Cambridge University was into this expedition field work. And so groups of people used to travel with a big team of assistants, and they would, as a group, go and spend a <coughs> time recording cultural phenomenon, botanical findings, zoological findings. They would measure the size of people's skulls uh, and all sorts of weird and wonderful things. But this guy was from Poland. And he ended up by going to what is now a part of Papua New Guinea. And he started his field work with no intention of staying a long time. But then the First World War happened. Now, because he was a, a Polish national, there was no way that he would have been able to travel home through the First World War because he would have had to have travelled through Australia. And in Australia, because the Poles had gone on the side of the Germans, he would have been arrested and interned as an enemy combatant. 
And so we ended up by staying there for two years and inventing this method, which is called... Malinowski invented a method of studying uh, an anthropological method, and what was the method he's associated with? Do you guys know? Participant observation. Now, what is participant observation? That means that I spend an extended time in a community amongst the people that I'm with, and I not only watch what they do, but I get involved in what they're doing so that I'm able to elicit a wide range of very, very grounded high quality, lots of high quantities of high quality ethnographic data, anecdotes, insights, peppered with conversations, which uh, at that time was a new phenomenon. If any of you are considering doing any kind of study that does not involve participant observation, perhaps you consider yourself to be far too busy and you only want to interview people. Well, let me tell you, People do, do not do what they say, and they do not say what they do. Because of that, um, you really should consider the importance of spending time with people. Uh, that is not rocket science. So, um, but sometimes the obvious needs to be stated. Yeah. Okay, so what I want to do, so when I, so here is my story. I lived in South Thailand. I shipped South Thailand 16 years ago. I lived in a bilingual Malay community in Bhutani for 10 years. Uh, four years after shifting there, I decided to do a PhD at the University of Bangsaan. Shamsul was one of my supervisors, Wan Sawari Ibrahim was my other supervisor. And I lived in this community and I studied a distinctively local aspect of Islam in that community for 10 years. Uh, so I'd been there four years by the time I started my PhD, and so uh, by 2010, I had to take my family back to New Zealand for a number of reasons. And just before leaving the community that I'd lived in for the first time, I met the first person in South Thailand who self-identified as a as a Muri of a Sufi order, and so I'd never met someone like that before, and so I enjoyed a number of long, and for me, fascinating conversations about this expression of Islam, which in Bhutani uh, is quite marginal. If you're from Penang, if you're from Sidamban, parts of Sindhiland, parts of Kalantan, actually Sufism is very, is, there are lots of Zawiyat, there's lots of Bondok that are associated with a range of orders, and I'll talk a bit about that. Uh, what I know of Suf the geography of Sufism in Malaysia. But that was the first time that I uh, met anyone. So when I was in New Zealand, I began to read about Sufism. And shortly after returning to Southeast Asia in 2012, I relocated to North Thailand and I began to do field work. Uh, I tried to, I spent about six months traveling around Thailand trying to make contact with anyone involved in any uh, Sufi uh, movement. A range ranging from established tariqat to what I would call ahli al hikmah or ahli al hakikat. In more interesting hakikat, and they they had their amalan and they are interested in this idea of hikmah more than a conventional tariqat. Okay, so I had no intention of starting a multi-sided study of Sufism in Thailand when I started the study. But as I travelled, I, I was informed that this group was there and that group was there. And after travelling around South Thailand for a number of months, it was clear to me about where the big orders were and that there was enough people interested in working with me for me to start a multi-sided study. And so these, this is a map of my fieldwork sites. My fieldwork sites are distributed between the central Thai-speaking centre of the country, the southern Thai-speaking upper south, and I, by that I mean around Lugor or Nakotsutamara, Phuket, down to Songkhla or Singora. 
uh, and then what I would call the Malay-speaking far south, which is south of southern Songkhla, where most people, most Muslims are bilingual Malay and Thai-speaking uh, people. So this is a, this is a map. This is a map of. Um, this is a this approximates the location and the spread of the four largest Sufi orders in Thailand. So very briefly, um, in central Thailand, the largest Sufi orders are in Ayutthaya. The largest order is the, the Kodariya, and more specifically, the Kodariya Wanachabandia. And the Kodariya Wanakshabandiya, which initially was established through uh, Kodariya missionary activities from Tamil Nadu, Nagori Sharif is a very important site of Kodariya activism in South Asia. And after the, the Portuguese uh, defeated uh, Malacca in 1511, all the portages, the ports, uh, across the Bay of Bengal became more important because Muslim traders were no longer trading through the Straits of Malacca. And so uh, the Kodariya were established in Ayutthaya in the 1600s, in the 1500s, the 16th century, but were revitalized through uh, local Kodariya studying in Mecca with people like Sheikh Ahmad Khatib al Shambasi. Uh, and his Khalifa, Abdul al Karim, who were the two important figures in the Kodariya Wanakshabandia, uh, which brought together the practices of the Kodariya and the Nakshabandia. These people from Ayutthaya studied with these two Indonesians, one from uh, Shambas, uh, Kalimantan, Miss Kalimantan, and the other from Bantem, uh, but they studied with these people in Maka. Okay? Uh, the other big order in Bangkok is the Shazaria, uh, not the Shataria, which is very important, obviously, in Sumatra and in Kelantan, but the Shazaria of Abdul Hassan al Shazari. And this was brought to Bangkok around 1927 through uh, Arab uh, Sheikh from the Hijaz. And I actually have a copy of his passport. So in central Thailand, those are the big orders, the Kadari and the Shazaria. The son of the initial Shazaria Sheikh, he actually shifted to uh, Lago or the Koti Kamara. And so nowadays, and he was buried in Satu, uh, just over the border from Beda. And so nowadays there are Shazaria in Bangkok, and there are also Shazaria in Grabi, in the Kotsi Tamarat as well as Sifu. So that's the second largest order. So when I say large order, the annual festivals will have a thousand to three thousand people uh, come for their whole year. Celebration of the, the death of the, of the Sheikh, um, which is called in, in uh, I don't know if it's an Arabic term, I think it's a it's a it's a Urdu term uh, an urs, which means a wedding, because the, the wali is married to his beloved, you know, Allah Ta'ala. So, Kodariya and Shazariya, two big orders. Kodariya only in central Thailand, the Shazariya in Bangkok, and also in the, what I call the southern Thai-speaking upper south, okay, which is the zone between central Thai-speaking Muslims and uh, Malay-speaking Muslims. The other order present in this part of the country is what is what I would call the Ahmadiyya Badawiya. Uh, this is the Ahmadiyya, This is an Ahmadiyya branch named after uh, Sheikh uh, uh, Ahmad. Uh, oh goodness, uh, Al Badawi uh, from Masir, yeah, from Egypt. Uh, they call themselves the Muhammadiyya. But as we know, this is a very generic term for uh, this. Is, there are so many, there are so many Ahmadiyya and there are so many um, Muhammadiyya. It becomes very confusing. So I'm referring to these people as the Ahmadiyya Badawiya. And so there, are, in in the Upper South, there are two large Sufi orders. 
The Ahmadiyya Badawi are actually originates from Kalantan, actually originates from Madra, from Madrasa Ahmadiyya, which for many years was led by the famous Haji Abdullah the Doher from Kalantan. So, uh, so that is the those are the two main orders in the Southern Thai speaking Upper South. And in the Malay speaking far south, we have uh, we have two orders, but they are distributed everywhere, so they're very hard to isolate. One is the Shatriya, which um, most traditional Bondoks, most traditional Basantara in Batani, used to have very strong influences from the Shatriya. So the famous chef uh, Daud Al Fotani, he's his dedicated with Shatriya. But since the late uh, 1800s and the early 20th century, the Ahmadiyya Idrisiya of Sheikh uh, Ahmad al Ibn Idris, uh, from originally from Morocco, uh, but which is the largest Sufi order in Malaysia with its base in Sidimban, that is the largest Sufi order in uh, the Malay speaking far south. But the reason for me having these maps is this. Initially, and this, I'm, now I'm going back to serendipity. Um, I mean, I haven't changed my topic. Uh, but as I analysed my data, as I began to spend more time with Khodriya in central, in central Thailand, with Shazriya in central Thailand, with the Shazriya in the southern Thai-speaking upper south, with the Apandiya Badawiya around Phuket and around Songkla and with the Apandiya Idrisiya, I began to notice something. And this is what I began to notice. I began to notice that south of Bangkok there were almost no Kodriya. Outside of the far southern provinces bordering on Galantan and of Pera, there were almost no Ahmadiyya Idrisiya. And that the, although the Ahmadiyya Badawiya originally came from Kalantan, uh, it had been adapted by the people that had adopted it amongst the southern Thai speaking Upper South. And it was absent amongst, it was completely absent amongst the Malay speaking southern provinces, as well as being almost entirely absent from um, Muslim populations in Ayutthaya and Bangkok. Um, the only order which breaks this rule is the Shazaria, and that is because the son of the founding chef, uh, who arrived in Bangkok in about 1927, his son shifted to South Thailand and gave him, began to give him ijazah and give baya uh, to uh, the Muslim, the Southern Thai speaking Muslims uh, in that part of the country. And so, and this is often the case when we do field work, and when we, we do field work with a specific research question in mind, but that we go about collecting data which is empirically rich when we really, really do due diligence in writing our field notes and then transcribing our interviews and, and not only doing that but analysing, asking questions of these things, not only asking questions to ourselves in the mirror but going back to our informants and saying, you know, why is it that no other, no other groups exist? Um, outside of here. So this this has become a real interest of mine. And so quite unexpectedly uh, this study which I anticipated as being a historical ethnography which is basically the ethnographic equivalent of a social history and we use different words to, sometimes because of our backgrounds, we use specific words to talk about the same thing. 
Uh, so a social history and an ethnographic, uh, uh, historical ethnography, they're basically the same thing. They are people that are interested in the past, but whose primary uh, data for assembling, reconstructing the picture of the past is from fieldwork rather than time and archives. And so, although I was be began by being interested in doing an historical ethnography, and I'm still interested in, in doing a very, very conventional a piece of religious anthropology with descriptions of various uh, zike, ngate, um, sulu, uh, a range of rituals and places from Balai to Surao to Zawiya amongst people who Kondaria, uh, Shazaria, Ahmadiyya, Badawir, as well as, as, as Ahmadiyya. Uh, this, is, this has opened me up to the cultural geography of Islam in Thailand. That in Thailand, um, local languages, local dialects are an important, remain a very, very important, arguably one of the most important elements in subnational identities. Now, these kind of dynamics that I'm describing also exist in, in Malaysia. The, the difference with Malaysia, obviously, is that you have a federal constitution and that you have got, uh, you have got a range of monarchs, who are, some of whom are sympathetic to Sufism, some who aren't. You have a range of Manjulis Ugama headed by muftis, headed by council, some of whom uh, you have different, in different states, you have different um, ethnic makeups. Negri Simbilan has your Minan background. The number of Javanese in Johor is larger than in other parts. Kelantan has the, higher proportion of, the highest proportion of Malay of all states. Some states have a relatively low. So your, the, the dynamics that contribute to sub-national identities in Malaysia are different from Thailand. But in Thailand, it is, we don't have a federal constitution, um, and the government is not so keen about uh, emphasising the way in which Bangkok absorbed other states. Um, but something that really continues to be very important in time is the presence of, is the distinct languages and dialects with which most people conduct everyday lives. And this is outside of the cosmopolitan cities uh, that these parts of Thailand have. And so uh, this is uh, arguably, this is not only my most surprising research finding, but one which has led me uh, to develop this study uh, using different methods. And I would like, because you guys are all uh, study, and I'd like to just tell you a little about this. Um, so, um, my, I became interested in collect, I, I became, in, I became interested in two things. Now remember, I, I started this study, this multi-sided study, after living in Patani for 10 years. And so I didn't really know the rest of the country particularly well. Uh, academics don't like telling others about what they don't know. Academics love to tell you about how much they know about a particular topic. But uh, this is an occupational hazard. That if we know a lot about one thing, sometimes... We believe our own propaganda that because we know lots about one thing, we're going to know lots about lots of things. And this is complete and utter nonsense. So I began, inter became interested in this idea of cultural geography. And of the. Initially, I was just interested in religious diversity amongst the Muslim community in Thailand. But now uh, I'm equally interested in the ethnic and the linguistic diversity of 
um, Thailand's population. So let's have a look at this map. This is a summary. This is a summary of a census taken in 1903. There are, there are similar censuses taken in British Malaya by the British. In fact, the first census taken by the British, I think, was in 18... Was it 1832 or 1830s? And around that time, there was an enormous controversy over how to classify people. Now, we, you know, you're here in the Centre of Ethnic Studies, so I don't need to give you a, a lecture about the uh, way that ethnic ethnonyms and exonyms and autonyms uh, that exonyms and ethnonyms are, was a very important part of colonial rule. Some people talk about divide and rule. Some people talk about define and rule. When we define you as this, we are able to exercise authority over you. A work which, uh, two work, uh, one, I mean, a number of works have really helped develop my understanding of. Um, uh, ideas of, of Thai-ness and Malay-ness. And right from the get-go, you need to know that I'm very much a constructivist. Uh, I have very little time for primordialist uh, perspectives on ethnic identity. Um, if your father is Chinese and your mother is Malay, then what are you? Well... That's an interesting question to ask. Uh, Joel Kahn wrote a very interesting book called The Other Malays, and his basic argument is this, is that if you look at colonial records, you will see that, well, first of all, British Malaya was, West Malaysia, the peninsula, was very sparsely populated. In the 1700s, the 1800s, most of the time there was a war. It was because kings needed slaves to do civil work. They needed there was corvée labour, and uh, and that many of us not enough attention has been given to the fact that uh, although there were Malay-speaking Muslim populations throughout the peninsula that these lived alongside bilingual Muslims who not only spoke a dialect of Malay, but they spoke Mandaling, they spoke Javanese, they spoke Minang, and I could go on and on about the different other Malays, bilingual Malays, from outside the peninsula that populated, um, and in some places dominated, Parts of the peninsula. So, uh, similar uh, similar dynamics exist in Thailand. Here is a, a census taken in 1903. It doesn't include the northeast, and it doesn't include all of North Thailand. But you'll see here the large concentration of Mon the distribution of Khmer, the distribution of Chinese. Now, obviously, Chinese immigration was huge at this time, uh, and you can see by the map. But look at the distribution of the Malays uh, in throughout uh, what was then called Siam uh, in 1903. Um, the Sansap Canal that runs through the middle of Bangkok, out east, it was dug by Malay prisoners of war. Um, I could give you lots of examples of prisoners of not just Muslim, but Malay material culture right throughout the Upper South as well as in Bangkok. Some of the Sufi orders present in Bangkok are directly from the South. In fact, there are some Malay communities, there are some Muslim communities in Bangkok that are gener ger generational to ago. Two generations were bilingual Malay and Thai. And there were some bilingual Malay Thai communities in Bangkok that used to num use, I I'm not familiar with the uh, Dranganu dialect, but they used to number, you know, Satu Dika, you know, 
but they used to use uh, Dranganu's accent when they counted, which makes us suggest that there were some refugees as far as south of Dranganu uh, relocating to Bangkok. So Thailand is a very ethnically diverse geobody. Now this map is from the 1600s to 1700s. It's from a UTR. And um, it's not... What's interesting for me about this map is that you will see this corner of the map, in fact, all throughout um, the southwestern part of the city. And the UTR really was the port city that inherited the trade from Malacca, because once traders stopped stopping in Malacca, they went right across the Bay of Bengal, used the portages across what is now Myanmar, to trade in Ayutthaya, because Ayutthaya could be reached by boats, but it could also be reached by a combination of boats and elephants from the west. And you'll see here, you might not be able to see it very clearly, but you'll see here some mosques and churches, and then some more mosques. So we often, when we think about Ayutthaya and Bangkok, we often think about Buddhism, and it's a predominantly Buddhist uh, 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 part of the country, but this has a very important cosmopolitan past. Again, going back to my title, a historical ethnog an ordinary ethnography of Sufism turned into an historical ethnography, which is turned into a, a, a cultural geography of Islam and Thailand. When we do, if we are doing multidisciplinary research, we need to start to adopt tricks from historians. Uh, hey, Lawrence, come on in, man. How are you doing? Don't worry, don't, don't worry. This is Lawrence Ross. Have a, have a seat, man. This is Lawrence. He's a good friend of mine, and he does field work in this part of the country. So I've almost finished Lawrence, so... Um, yeah, I figured out. No, that's all right. Um, uh, Lawrence can introduce himself after I've finished. So, uh, and I'm looking forward to you guys meeting him. So, just my last comment. Um, there is a, an enormous dark side to Malay nationalism. And there is also an enormous dark side to Siamese nationalism. Malay nationalism likes to... A retrospectively rewrite history to talk about there being some kind of primordial, solid, static Malay identity. Now, this is complete and utter nonsense. Uh, if we look at, you know, your recent prime ministers, if we look at the most important people involved in your your history, all of these, all of these people have histories, family histories from everywhere: Bugis, Makassaris. Uh, uh, South India, there are Hadramis, I could go on and on, and I don't need to go on and on because this is your country, not mine. But um, uh, just as Thailand is no longer as comfortable with cosmopolitanism and with diversity as they used to be, obviously, well, from my assessment, it might be obvious to you, but obvious, it is obvious to me, that there is a struggle and a lack of comfort with diversity and difference. In the past, this part of the world was renowned for being diverse and that it was normal for everyone to be different. The last thing I just wanted to make, and in terms of that also, I want to emphasize the, the, um, the way in which serendipitously as our data, our ethnographic data grows, we need to look for other places to triangulate what we are finding. And so, quite serendipitously, this project, which initially was going to be a very boring, no, it wasn't going to be boring, I was just going to, I imagined that I would be sitting, observing Sufi rituals, talking to people about their journey away from the mainstream, into the margins because they had a hunger after God and were 
dissatisfied by it, the austere Islam that they may have been exposed to. But this very serendipitously led me to be interested in the, how is it that these Sufi orders, they don't move from North Thailand, and Central Thailand to the Upper South. Groups that come to the Upper South, the Southern Thai speaking out of the South, never move to Central Thailand, they never move South. Why is it that the Ahmadi Idrisiya has stayed amongst Malay-speaking Muslims. And so that led me, and this is my final point with which I will conclude, this led me to go and get very, very interested in cartography because I, was, I wasn't prepared to just believe what, uh, how historians have reconstructed uh, the development of Thai and Malay ethnic identity in, or a sense of belonging uh, uh, throughout the peninsula and so what I did is I began to collect maps and some of these maps you mightn't be able to see it very clearly but this is a part of the of the upper south that um, Lawrence knows very well and you'll see and this is actually taken from Skinner's um, translation of the epic of the Battle of Jiang Silong where the, the Thai king press ganged the king of Gadah to go and fight uh, expel the Burmese from the Andaman, from, from Phuket. And you'll see that these place names, in this epic he uses lots of place names. And he's provided a very nice map in which Malay names are put beside uh, Thai names. And so this is just one example of the way in which um, nation states and rulers begin to uh, change the history to bring it more in line with uh, the way, the trajectory that they had planned uh, for their subjects. And so the Siamese uh, state, the Thai state, has been very effective at marginalising um, other tongues and at um, replacing uh, Malay place names with Thai place names. And this is uh, one aspect of the wider project of ethnogenesis, um, where, yeah. Anyway, listen, I've gone over time, and so why don't I uh, hand, over to, uh, hand over to the moderator. I don't know whether we're going to be hearing uh, clarifying questions before, but I'll just hand over to you, yeah. Thank you very much. I hope that's made sense. Yeah, good. <laughs> Let me, let me apologize first. Not My at all. point is that I am playing two roles today, having Good. one year and the other part of looking at the uh, food and society meeting. No problem. <laughs> so it's like two places. No problem. I, I wish I could have a, another team sister. Um, but anyway, thank you so much, Dr. Chris, for the presentation. I do have questions, but let me open to the floor to others to actually ask questions. If Nazim has one, it's not yet. Oh, this is Lawrence Ross, Dr. Lawrence Ross. Yeah, Lawrence and I have worked. No problem, no problem. No worries, no worries. Pussing, pussing. <laughs> yeah, okay. No worries. No yes, problem. I really would like to know why Sufism. I know that you, from the beginning you mentioned that you, you read about Sufism. No one's done any. No one's done any work on this at all. There's absolutely nothing written about Sufism in Thailand. But there are dozens of there's gazillions of books analysing Malay nationalism, Malay uh, Islamic insurgencies. Uh, the Dublik have had a number of important studies done. Reformism has been done to death. Gaon Muda, Gaon Dua. Uh, there's been gazillions of studies of, of Malay fishing villages, so there's a desperate need to be doing something interesting, empirically rich, original, and this is why Ed Lawrence and I, well, he might like me, but I like him. 
Uh, this is why Lawrence. This is why I like working with Lawrence because he he, he does something new and interesting. He's, in, he's into. He's done this wonderful study of Rongeng, uh in in uh, comparing Malay speaking troops as well as um, uh, Thai speaking troops in 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 the Upper South and the up in the Southern Thai speaking uh, portion of the peninsula. And so there is a real need for. And if you guys are doing studies that everyone's done already, then just stop. Don't do it. Do something new, do something interesting. So nothing has been written at all. In fact, nothing has really been done on Sufism in, Thai, in Malaysia for a long time. The last study was of the of the Nakshabandi Hokoni and the use of Sila. Uh, that was published about almost 10 years ago now, and so it's time for another one. Yeah. So, so looking at what your topic today, you, you mentioned that Sufism is the category of Islam. So... Um, I was trying to say that having this geography that map a different kind of Sufism, whether I never heard of this, in Shatiriya, mm. I know the Fatiriya, Ahmadiyya, I'm, I'm used to hear about that, but not the Alawiyya and the Shatiriya. So having this, are you, are, are, is it a way of saying that Islam is not really united in a way, but it's more... No, that's not an argument at all. That's not my argument at all. I think that it is a common phenomenon that, okay, so if you were to go to Penang, okay. and if you were to uh, be interested in Sufism, then most of the Kotari you meet there are going to be Tamil. Tamil. They're going to be Tamil, ethnically Tamil. Okay? Because the, there's the Darga of uh, Sheikh Hamid Shaul um, Hamid, sorry. Um, if I was to if I was to meet a, a, a Hadrami of Sufi intonation, I'm almost, if I was to, I, I, I can safely assume that he's a Ba'alawiya. Uh, in certain states, there are certain orders that have been patronized by the king. So, for example, if I go to Pera, most of the, most of the people of Sufi intonation in Pera are Naqshbandiya and Naqshbandiya Khalidiya, more specifically. And so... There's a very, uh, you, uh, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to, again, my introduction about serendipity was intended to make the point that often when we set out to study something, uh, in the course of studying something, one thing leads to another. And this is this, you know, lovely, um, lovely chapter in this book, Applied uh, Anthropology, Unexpected Spaces, Topics and Methods on Embedded Action Anthropology and How One Thing Leads to Another that in the course of doing the study, uh, looking at what Sufi movements exist where, I began to see, well, these these movements don't move. Oh. They don't move. They So amongst Central Thai-speaking uh, Muslims, you find a certain cons uh, cluster of, of, of orders, and, and mass orders. Now, that doesn't mean to say that you don't have a few um, Indian migrants who are, you know, who are Naqshbandi Khokhani, and you can go to the Hadra, no problem. You know, so there are some people in Central Thailand who study with the son of the founding sheikh of the Ahmadiyya Badawiya in Bangkok, but this is the exception. I mean, there are 20 students, but they have, you know, 5,000 followers who go to Mesfu Shaban and got Yaonoi every year. So, uh, so there is a there is a correlation between there is a close correlation between the order and the in Thailand. We have a number of sub-national identities. And in terms of the, the cultural geography of Islam in South Thailand, it's really the, the, the language of everyday life that uh, is an important marker of sub-national identities. And so, for example, you know, in the Upper South, there are you know, very, very crude and disingenuous assessments of Malays in South Thailand. You know, why on earth are they causing so much trouble? Uh, you know, what is the problem? Get over it, guys, you know. Um, so, uh, that was my argument, that was my point. Yeah. Okay, please, sir. Thanks for an interesting topic. Because I never heard of this before, so I never had a citizen. So, when we compare the citizen in the Thailand and Indonesia, and the Indonesian talks about a lot of sexuality in our for example. So, in the Thailand context, so, What's the differences between Thailand and Indonesia in the context of Sufism? Okay, that's a good question. Okay, so first of all, I don't really know enough about about um, Indonesia. Okay, 
So I think that, but the little that I do know about <coughs> Sufism in Indonesia is that again you will see certain parts of Java are more more likely to be aligned. Okay, so West West Java is very very thoroughly Kodari Wachabandia. Okay, so uh, Minang probably predominantly Shatria, yeah, because of the patronage of the. But in Medan, probably more. My guess is Nakshabandia, Halidia, yeah. Uh, yeah, Nakshabandia, but which branch of the Nakshabandia? It's not Mazaharia, Nakshabandia, not Mazaharia, more real islands. Uh, and the straight settlements, because of the importance of migrant populations, you've got you've got Kadaria of a different branch. And so there are, so this is I'm, really what I'm beginning to do is I'm beginning to explore the range of factors that lead to the maintenance, the establishment and maintenance of sub-national identity, regional identities. Uh, but I don't know enough about, you know, the, 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 what cluster of Sufi Tariqa you, you would tend to find in East Java compared to Central Java, compared to West Java. But I do know that in West Java, Kodari Wanachabandia is by far the most the most important, but in Sumatra, probably it's now Nakshabandi Halidia. Yeah, does that answer your question? Uh, if, you, if I haven't, then please ask another one. I you feel free to ask a, a, a follow up question if I haven't answered it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have uh, West Kalimantan or West Kalimantan? Yeah, West Kalimantan. They, they have a lot of Ahmadiyya. Ahmadiyya Idrisiya? Which Ahmadiyya though? Yeah, this this I, I, I want to ask, ask you the second question. So, which Ahmadiyya? Because they, they have a square in the Ahmadiyya region, in the South Kalimantan region. Because South Kalimantan is a near in the Marquez, my hometown in Tawang. So, I never heard Ahmadiyya in the Tawang. Maybe, maybe they, maybe they try to, what they call, they want to, they, they like to hide their religions. Are you talking about Ahmadiyya from North India or Ahmadiyya Idrisiya? Ahmadiyya Idrisiya, yeah. Because in Indonesia, Ahmadiyya is uh, Indonesia, 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 Indonesia. No, 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 it's complete. This is, we're talking, we're talking cross purposes, we're not talking about the same thing. The, the Ahmadiyya, so the Ahmadiyya, so in Sidambang, okay, uh, so in Sidambang, uh, Negri Sembilan, uh, the, tra traditionally the Mufti of Negri Sembilan comes from the family that established the Ahmadiyya Idrisiya. The Ahmadiyya Idrisiya comes from Sheikh Ahmad ibn Idris, so an, an 18th century uh, Moroccan scholar. Who shifted to the Hijaz and he established a, a, an order, uh, and the offshoots of those order were the Danja, Dijaniya, the Sanusiya, and the Ahmadi Idrisiya that came to South Southeast Asia, and is the most important Sufi order in Malaysia and and particularly in the Gusimbilan. So we're talking about cross purposes. Like they scared and they say, uh, you know what they're doing. Yeah. Uh, it's like uh, the virgin, like yeah. 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 Well, I mean, yeah, okay. So, um, was Doc Ganali divergent? Was Doc Ganali divergent? Sasa. Was he divergent, Doc Ganali? You think not? But Doc Ganali, during the Hajj period, he used to walk around. Uh, Kotabaru in Ihram. So suck it up. <laughs> so, so, um, Sheikh Daur al Fatani was a Shatariya. Was Sheikh Daur al Fatani Sasa? How about Abdul, uh, how about, um, how about, um, Abdul Samad al Balimbani? So suck it up. <laughs> well, I mean, it's for you to answer, not for me to answer. I'm not a Malaysian. I mean, this is just, people are retrospective, I mean, 
Ibn Taymiyyah was a Qadriya. Ibn Taymiyyah was a Qadriya. Yeah, he was a Qadriya. And anyway, if you look at the list of apostates, the most famous, do you want to know the most famous apostates in Islamic history? All of the Imams of the Mazahads, Shafi'i was an apostate, Imam Hanafi was an apostate, Ibn Taymiyyah was an apostate. Oh, so. <laughs> Well, okay, if I go and if I if I go and cut someone's head off under a black flag, am I divergent? Yeah, if I go and cut someone's head off under a black flag, is that divergent? <laughs> That's terrible, is it? Yeah, yeah, go for it, go for it. <laughs> There's no state control. There's no state control. Well, no state. Yeah, I mean, you have the... Uh, the, the it's the, a tiger with no teeth. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. But in Thailand, basically, things can go freely as they want to go. So you have a lot more diversity yeah. compared to Malaysia. And even Indonesia. Indonesia is perhaps a little more than Malaysia. So yeah. In, in terms of regional context, it's become more political. Yeah. So, so, so we normally say that state control is completely absent when it yeah. comes to religions in Thailand. Yeah. But when I look at the many notes that Thailand is clearly assimilation process in terms of the names, in terms of but when it comes to religions, kind of they should um, kind of having a free more free flow. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't yeah, I mean um, I mean there's a you know, um, <clears throat> Their policy on language, supporting mother tongue language, is appalling. Um, you know, they have a, they don't, I mean, there's many things that you can rightly Thailand are doing, but I, I'm very unconvinced at accusations that Thailand doesn't provide religious freedom. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's basically yeah. Yeah. So, so I mean, there are there are groups. There, I mean, I mean, I I'm obliged to. I mean, I'm not an ustad, so you're not my student. So, you know, I don't. You know, my responsibility here is to make you think. My responsibility here is not to tell you what is right and wrong because you're not children; you're adults. And I'm a I'm a visiting lecturer. I'm not your ustad. You know. So, um, so. Um, but, you know, even as someone who is, you know, uh, committed to a charitable but an objective study, there are some groups that, you know, quite frankly, are very weird. Um, I mean, there's this one guy, he's from, he's a Mu'ala from Surin. And, I mean, he, he, uh, he, I mean, he, um, he was attracted, he, I mean, he never. I've stayed with him for days. I've never seen him pray. He, you know, he. Uh, it was really funny. One day on a Friday, when I was staying with him, the um, you, you know what it's like in, in Malay villages. So just before Friday prayers, you know, you had the the speaker going crackly. I know you guys. You haven't been to prayers for the last two weeks. We've got a list of people that haven't been there. And we're going to start to find you guys, so you better get organised and get ready, you know. <laughs> and so, and so, uh, we were sitting on the porch. You boy was sitting there chewing beetle nut and smoking cigarettes. So everyone looks at each other, and some people have another cup of coffee. Other people cut some more beetle nut, and then, um, and then a couple of the guys says, "Oh, I'll just uh, be back soon." So they go. <laughs> so okay, so I mean, there, I mean, there's this one guy. I mean. He he says, you know, he says, I said, oh, have you been to the Hajj? And he says, yep, complete and utter waste of money. He says, complete and utter waste of money. Uh, 
Uh, he says, you know, after I, after, I mean, he, he believes that he, you know, he would say, you know, that he, he kind of, he's more of an ahlil uh, hakikat, you know, he's into mysteries and, and, and so he kind of, he kind of thinks that he's beyond the, the sharia, um, despite the fact that the prophet continued to pray for the rest of his life. So, um, there are some groups that, for me, I mean, yeah, I mean, are, are very clearly divergent, and there are others that are unconventional. I mean, one of the leaders of one group, I mean, he can't read Arabic. And he, he his, 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 his brother has got the Ijazah, and his brother does all the Baya. But he will, he, he watches YouTube, and he reads books in English, and then he gives religious lessons based on that. There is, I mean, so there's this enormous, there's this enormous range. I mean, and if I, I've got some photos here on the screen here, you'll see some of the photos. I mean, this is a, uh, I mean, this is, this is a, uh, this is a makam in central Thailand. All throughout South Asia, you know, Sufi shrines are visited uh, by both by both Hindus and Muslims. But often they will, you know, they will give flowers. Um, you know, there are. This is part of of what Nazar. You know, um, so um, I mean, this this is a this is a photo of. Uh, the seat of of a wali before he died, and very old, he was carried around the seat, and the seat is considered to have imbibed his baraka, you know. Yeah. And so these guys will actually do a tawa. They will take the the seat around the mosque and the makam seven times. That's where I would really love to take you one day when you've got some free time. Yeah, let's. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so I mean, there are things. So, okay, so we, we say now, okay, this is Sasa. But I tell you, throughout South and Middle East, I mean, this, these things happen everywhere. So the problem in, in Malaysia is this, in my humble opinion, <laughs> is that you, the, the Islamic authorities, are very successfully narrowing, 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 narrowing down the vision of what Muslims in Malaysia are exposed to, and what they consider to be orthodox. Now, my assessment, my—I mean, I mean, there are some Muslim, there are some believers, whether they are Christians or Muslims, that they act like lawyers and they act like accountants. Okay, they've got no soul. All they want to know is what is right and what is wrong, and how much it's going to cost me, and whether it's going to be to my profit. There are some believers that are more like artists. And I know the type of person that I would like to be. That doesn't mean to say that I'm about to do things that are completely, have no juristic. And I'm, I'm theologically trained, so I have a great respect for scripture. And I have great respect and sympathy for the desire for orthodoxy. But, um, so we may say that doing a tawaf, doing a tawaf is completely outrageous. But I tell you what, if you were to, I mean, like I love talking to people in Galantan particularly about Dokkanali. You know, so I mean, Dokkanali did all sorts of stuff that probably now would land him into jail. I mean, like he he used to wear ihram during 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 the Hajj months. If he did that now, would he be arrested? Probably would. And often we confuse, the thing is that we confuse, we confuse Sufism, we, we, we assume that Suf, Sufis, people of a Sufi inclination, are divergent. Now, Dr. Ghanadi, he reformed the madrasa system. He wasn't in favor of reading the Dalki. He established new publications, which are the hallmark of the you know, the Gaul Muda, yeah? But he wasn't a Gaul Muda in the sense that he dispensed with, with, uh, with Tassel. He, he was a practitioner, and he, he taught, he taught this. Yeah. 
Yeah. All of that comes from from Yeah. 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 And that's right. That's yeah. yeah. So so I mean, ultimately, ultimately. Ultimately, these are issues that don't really involve me. They're really your responsibility, and I wouldn't want to. I'm not. I don't want to be introducing fitma uh, here, but 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 this is for me. If I'm to speak candidly, this is a real concern to me because all the time I'm talking with young people who basically they just they're not comfortable with difference. They're not comfortable with diversity, and for me, that's the biggest problem. And the other thing is that they're uncritical about their religious leaders, that they uh, they are not being exposed to uh, the breadth of Islamic traditions, uh, and the, you know uh, it's just it's just I mean don't, you know like there is nowhere else in the Muslim world that I know that a Christian is told they can't call God Allah. This is ridiculous. This is complete and utter nonsense. Um, yeah. It's not questions, but uh, while, while Dr. Chris was talking about this, I listen to Tama Radio, mm. Radio, and we have this segment of uh, Pusu Book where, where all these people from Dunai Madrasa were discussing about this in the morning. And I remember them actually mentioning the book. So when you say most of the Sufis in Malaysia are Dunai Madrasa, all of the Sufi, most of the Sufis in 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 Penang would be would yeah. be Tamil, yeah, because and they'd be Kadiria, yeah. Okay. Just because I remember they would be invited. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. And just to add on, like you said, people should not forget about their roots of the land, of the nation. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is a, ultimately a question that you have to answer. I mean, uh, I mean, I think that I've, often we, I mean, for many years I was deeply committed to studying religious traditions because assuming that you know, I mean, as as a person of faith myself, I felt that there was a lack of people who were conservative and confessional but we're also willing to study other religious traditions. And I'm, I'm committed to continuing to do that, but I guess the other thing is that we shouldn't conflate every... Let's look at the Middle East, okay? Is the, the, the Middle East... Parts of the Middle East are in the mess that they are because of tribal separa separations. I mean, many of us really inadequate, have an inadequate understanding of the deeply... Tribal nature of of you know society in the Middle East, and you know we we love to we love to analyze the role of you know Salafism in violence, and we love to boil every issue in a Muslim majority country to Islam. Uh, but this is just not the case. There is social injustice. There's 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 political dysfunction. There's you know. So religion is important, but let's not forget issues of language loyalty, of language loss, of cultural identity, of linguistic and cultural genocide, even, you know, and, and, and again, this is something that both Malaysia and Thailand have got a lot in common about, and that's one of the reasons why I'm so pleased to be affiliated to a Malaysian university, because there's very little people comparing the dark side of the nationalist project on both sides of the border. I don't know whether you'd agree, Lawrence, but I think there needs to be more oh, people. Absolutely. Yeah. You don't mind, could I ask yes, yes. one more question? Because as long as I've got your message, these, uh, we have to think of these groups of sects, these, these uh, uh, organizations as, as living yeah. organisms. In sense. Yeah. They rise, they fall, yeah. they, they, they coalesce co around charismatic yeah. personalities. So their history is full of all types of interesting yeah. twists and turns. And now, especially now, we see a lot of um, people trying to 